Hello, and welcome back to the Serve Safe Food Protection Manager Certification Training Online. My name is Mr. Dan Delcher, and I am a certified Serve Safe instructor with the Essex County Schools of Technology. We are now going to pick up with Chapter 2 Understanding the Micro World. Our objectives in Chapter 2 are to identify the following conditions that affect the growth of foodborne bacteria, also known as fat tom, major foodborne pathogens and their sources, resulting illnesses and their symptoms, ways to prevent viral, bacterial, parasitic, and fungal contamination natural occurring toxins, and ways of preventing illnesses caused by them. So pathogens. We are starting off with the contaminant known as biological. Um, we are starting off with pathogens. So the path, the most of our biological are either known as um, bacteria, viruses, toxins, and parasites. Um, we refer to as a pathogen as a microorganism. Um, it's a small living organism that can be seen only with a microscope. This pathogen is harmful and makes people sick when eating or produces toxins that cause illness. So sometimes bacteria, as they are moving around in the food or um, multiplying, um, they produce a, a toxin. It's not the actual microorganism that's making sick, sick, making you sick, but it's the toxin that's making you sick. And a toxin is usually some sort of chemical or poison. So again, the pathogens that we're looking at in chapter two that contaminate food and cause foodborne illness are bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. So how does contamination happen? Well, in terms of biological, um, contamination. Most food handlers can contaminate food when they don't wash their hands after using the restroom. They are in contact with a person who is sick. They sneeze or vomit onto food or food contact surfaces, and they touch dirty food contact surfaces and equipment, and then touch food. Simple mistakes can cause contamination, such as allowing ready-to-eat food to touch a surface that contacted raw meat, seafood, or poultry, storing food or cleaning products incorrectly, and failing to spot signs of pests. Again, a lot of this will, uh, the precautions to this type of contamination will discuss in further detail. Um, we will, but as you as you can notice, most of your uh, main issues when it comes to biological contaminations is making sure that you are practicing um, good personal hygiene and you are avoiding cross contamination. So, what are some of the common symptoms? of foodborne illness relating to uh, a biological pathogen. Well, some of the common symptoms of foodborne illness include diarrhea, vomiting, fever, nausea, abdominal cramps, jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin and eyes. Based on this uh, picture that you can see, you can see that the gentleman's Eyes are kind of a little bit yellow and not pure white. Sometimes these symptoms, um, each of these symptoms can depend on the type of foodborne illness. You're not going to 
um, get all of these symptoms. Um, each, each disease has a different symptoms and we're going to take a look at those different um, symptoms. And these symptoms can um, range from 30 minutes to six weeks. So depending on the uh, pathogen, you could be experiencing them for a short amount of time or a extended prolonged amount of time. Again, one of the um, major, you know, one of the major things that we want to avoid is if we are experiencing these symptoms that we want to um, get medical attention because they can, some of these diseases that we're going, and bacteria that we're going to be looking at can cause death. So there are six pathogens known as the big six. These pathogens are highly infectious and can cause severe illness, even death. And they include Salmonella typhi, Shigella species, non-typhoidal salmonella, Shiga toxin producing Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli, hepatitis A, and neurovirus. You are going to complete a creative um, project about one of these big six pathogens. Um, please refer to this project activity in your Google Classroom. So the big six pathogens are often found in very high numbers in an infected person's feces, can be transferred to food easily, and can make a person severely sick from small doses. All it takes is maybe one spoonful of the food and you can, like a tasting spoon, and you could become sick from one of these big six. So some additional general information about bacteria. Um, they have shared characteristics um, found almost everywhere. They cannot be seen, smelled, or tasted. Grow rapidly if conditions are correct and can produce toxins as they grow and die. So again, bacteria are all around us. They're even, you know, you've heard that there are bad bacteria and good bacteria. Um, we're gonna talk about, you know, those bad bacteria in this uh, chapter too. Um, but the most common way to prevent foodborne illness from bacteria is controlling time and temperature. So there are six factors that bacteria need to grow. And we know that them as fat tom. F for food, A for acidity, T for temperature, T for time, O for oxygen, and M for moisture. Let's learn more about what fat tom represents. Food. Most bacteria need nutrients to survive. TCS food supports the growth of bacteria better than other types of food. Acidity. Bacteria grow best in food that contains little or no acidity. A pH of 7.5 to 4.6 is usually ideal. Examples of food that are in that ideal range of 4.6 to 7.5 are bread, raw chicken, cantaloupe, milk, and cooked corn. Again, most of these examples of, of um, ideal pH foods are actually uh, foods that are considered TC, uh, TCS foods. Temperature. Bacteria grows rapidly between 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, or 5 degrees Celsius and 57 degrees Celsius. 
This range is known as the temperature danger zone. Although the temperature danger zone is 41 to 135, bacteria grow even more rapidly from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to 125 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius to 52 degrees Celsius. This range of 70 to 125 is, uh, we usually commonly know this as, you know, um, room temperature or um, above that, you know, if you don't get it to the right temperature on your stove or in the oven, you know, you're going to have an issue. Bacteria growth is limited when food is held above or below the temperature danger zone. So it's important that when we're keeping stuff cold, that we keep it below 41 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we heat stuff up or, uh, yeah, when we heat stuff up, we want to heat it up to above 135. We're going to talk more about um, exemptions and what some of the proper cooking temperatures are for certain foods in a future chapter. Time. Bacteria need time to grow. The more time bacteria spend in the temperature danger zone, the more opportunity they have to grow to unsafe levels. It's important that when we receive cold foods that we get it right into the cold. And when we're trying to heat up foods, we want to get it in, uh, into a pan or get it into the, um, into the oven as quickly as possible so that we can get it out of the temperature danger zone. Oxygen. Some bacteria need oxygen to grow. Other bacteria grow when oxygen isn't there. Moisture. Bacteria grow well with high levels of moisture. This is measured by AW, which is water activity. The amount of moisture available in food for bacterial growth. AW scale ranges from 0.0, .0 to 1.0. Water has a water activity of 1.0. Most foods that are affected based on bacteria growth due to moisture, usually bacteria growth grows between 0.85 or higher. So we want to avoid um, allowing moist foods to be out in the temperature danger zone. Controlling fat time conditions. The conditions you can control, obviously it's hard to control the food, the acidity of the food, Oxygen is all around us, and things are already moist. So the things that you are going to be able to control are time and temperature. Time, limit how long TCS food spends in the temperature danger zone. And temperature, keep TCS food out of the temperature danger zone. We're going to discuss more about how we do this and how we know whether we're in the temperature danger zone in a future chapter. We know that bacteria, once it gets onto a food, goes through several stages of growth. First, bacteria starts off in the lag phase. That's when the bacteria first gets onto the food. It kind of sits there, kind of not sure what to do yet, um, and doesn't start to feed. As time goes on, bacteria start to grow and then move into the log phase. And the log phase is when the bacteria go through a extensive um, doubling of um, bacteria. We know based on previous studies that bacteria can double um, the number of cells of bacteria within 20 minutes. So one cell gets on the food, it will double to two in 20 minutes, uh, four cells in 40 minutes, eight cells in an hour, 
16 cells in an hour and 20 minutes, and there could be over billions within 10 hours. Once it starts to go through this log phase, eventually they reach a point of stationary phase, and usually this is where they start to slow down their production of new cells and um, kind of conserve their resources. And then they start to go into, the cells start to go into a, um, bacteria cells start to go into a death phase where they are, the cells are dying, but they are also reproducing at the same time. So there is kind of a, a lowering of the bacteria at this death point. But as you can see, based on the graph, it's not going to go completely to zero. At this point in the death, uh, the death range of bacteria, they are going to, basically your, your meat pro, your product that you're working with is probably severely contaminated and is starting to rot and go through other processes. So, So some of these stages of um, growth occur um, differently depending on, uh, or can occur differently depending on um, time and temperature. So as you can see, a this is an example of the number of spore, a uh, number of cells of Salmonella. Obviously, within two days, you can have an abundance of salmonella cells um, if the food's kept at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius. Now, if we were to keep, some, keep the food at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, again, it's not low enough. It's still in the temperature danger zone. We're going to be okay. It could be okay for couple days maybe two days um to keep it in that area but once it gets about one to two days that's when the bacteria are going to start to begin to develop um because it's cold but it's not cold enough same thing with 44 degrees fahrenheit we've also found we could probably get um food by in three days, um, but then by three days, um, that salmonella is going to start to uh, increase. 42, obviously 42, is um, close enough to the temperature danger zone and will basically keep it level and not produce, the you know, the number of cells of salmonella will not um, double at all. So bacteria can change into spores. Spores are often found in dirt, can survive cooking temperatures, and can change back to a form that grows. Some major foodborne bacteria include these. The major um, and these these disease uh, bacteria can also be controlled by time and temperature and keep these bacteria from causing a foodborne illness as well. So we're going to go through each of these bacteria. I'm going to I'm not going to read the slides. Um, for each of these, but you, I'm going to give you about a few seconds to read um, through each of these slides.
All right. General information about viruses. Viruses are carried by human beings and animals. They require a living host to grow, do not grow in food, and can be transferred through food and remain infectious in food. Food, water, or any contaminated surface, it can be a source of viruses and typically occur through fecal oral routes. Fecal oral of routes refers to when someone uses the restroom, um, doesn't wash their hands properly, still has some of traces of fecal matter or uh, urine on their hands, and then either touches themselves because we can, in, unfortunately, we can infect ourselves, and then touch it or touches food or other people. So it's important when it comes to viruses that we practice um, good personal hygiene. Viruses can be transferred from person to person, person to food, and person to food contact surfaces. People carry viruses in their feces and can transfer from their hands after using the restroom. So it's important that you wash your hands when you leave the restroom. Viruses cannot be destroyed by normal cooking temperatures. So the best ways to prevent measures from viruses are excluding food handlers who are vomiting or have diarrhea or jaundice from working. Make sure food handlers wash their hands regularly and correctly and avoid bare hand contact with ready to eat food. So again, the food borne viruses that we're mostly dealing with is hepatitis A and neurovirus. Um, a lot of people, you'll hear a lot on the news about neurovirus, especially with um, cruise ships. Um, a lot of the times people um, don't wash their hands properly. And because of the hustle and bustle of a cruise ship, a lot of the times the employees don't properly wash their hands. And that's what causes a neurovirus outbreak. Parasites. Parasites require a host to live and reproduce. Parasites are most commonly found in seafood, wild game, and food processed with contaminated water, such as produce. Again, parasites are all around us as well and can easily be picked up. How do we prevent parasites from getting into our food? Well, we want to purchase our food from approved reputable suppliers, people that we know are not going to, uh, that are ensuring that their seafood or produce is being produced in a proper manner. Um, cook food to required minimum internal temperatures. So again, most parasites are killed off by temperature. So if we cook it properly, we're going to uh, kill off that parasite. And fish that will be served raw or undercooked must be frozen correctly by the manufacturer. So again, we need to keep uh, fish and other um, crustaceans and shellfish frozen before we plan on eating it.
Oops. Fungi. Fungi sometimes make people sick. Um, they commonly spoil food. Some examples of fungi include mold and yeast. Uh, mold, basic characteristics of mold, uh, spoil food and sometimes cause illness, may produce toxins, grow well in almost any condition, especially in acidic food and low water activity, and are only slowed, not destroyed by cooler or freezer temperatures. Our best prevention is throw out all moldy food unless the mold is a natural part of the food. It's important that if you have any questions about mold, that you talk with your culinary arts instructor about what, uh, how to identify good molds and what are uh, natural molds that are supposed to be in the food. A lot of the times your natural molds are going to be found in cheeses, like blue cheese. Uh, yeast, the basic characteristics of yeast can spoil food quickly, may produce a smell or taste of alcohol as it spoils food, may look like a white or pink discoloration or slime, and may bubble. Uh, grow well in acidic food with little moisture. Prevention, throw away food containing yeast. Again, there's some times where yeast is good, um, in these situations, yeast is bad. Um, and again, you want to talk to your culinary arts instructor about the difference between good yeast and bad yeast. Biological toxins. There are sources of other biological toxins, such as uh, seafood, plants, and mushrooms. Seafood toxins cannot be smelled or taste. They cannot be destroyed by freezing or cooking. And the sources in fish are usually naturally occurring. They're pathogens. Fish that have eaten smaller fish that have eaten the toxin. Sources in shellfish include shellfish that have eaten algae that are toxic. Um, one seafood toxin that has come up a lot is also mercury. Um, it's gotten into the water and has been absorbed by a lot of different fish. Um, but there are definitely some different toxins based on, you know, what does the fish eat and what does the what does the fish eat and what does the um, the animal uh, the shellfish eat to create that toxin. Sometimes toxins are also because um, the fish naturally breaks it down, or it's something, or it's a toxin that they naturally have in their body in order to affect predators. Um, Mushroom toxins, their foodborne illness is linked with toxins. They're usually caused by eating toxic wild mushrooms. They occur when toxic mushrooms are mistaken for edible ones. Can be prevented by purchasing from approved reputable suppliers. It's important that you avoid um, using wild mushrooms. You want to make sure that uh, if you're working in a restaurant that's using wild mushrooms, that it comes from a supplier, don't just go out into the middle of the woods 
and and harvest some mushrooms um, because you could easily make somebody sick if you're not sure what you're doing. Only trained professionals um, should be utilized when using wild mushrooms. Some other foodborne illnesses linked with plant toxins usually happen when plants are purchased from unapproved suppliers, can happen when certain plants aren't cooked correctly, um, such as uncooked kidney beans, and can be prevented by purchasing plants from approved reputable suppliers. So this concludes chapter two. If you need to refer back to any of the slides that I did not speak about um, on each of the different individual bacterias, viruses, toxins, um, please, you know, replay this video or rewind. Uh, feel free to pause where needed. Um, to use it as a use this video as a resource while you're completing um, the Google form. So now that you have watched this video, uh, be sure to also watch the uh, the chapter two and three contamination um, video from the National Restaurant Association, and then complete the Google form for chapter two. Thank you.